Hi there, Graham Vincent, violin maker and musician. It's uh, it's sort of Q and A time, so I'm going to do the Q and As, and I'm also just going to have a general general witter on for a bit, if you don't mind. Um, I printed off some of the questions that sort of came up on the last couple of the last couple of um, videos, um, and uh, yeah, and I'm just going to go through those and generally talk about a lot of the stuff as well. So um, at the moment, what am I doing? Well. I'm on the second one of these wormy chestnut violins. Um, I've um, I've steamed the outside of this to sort of lift any any little dings and bumps and so on, so that when I flatten this back now, um, it won't subsequently sort of rise up. Uh, you know, there won't be little sort of blemishes developing. Um, I've done the neck already. I'm just just going to carry on with that. I'm actually using. Um, Rather than conventional files and rasps, I've been using little diamond files on this um, because uh, the advantage I find in some situations with these little things is they don't, um, because they don't have a regular cut pattern, you don't get a sort of, um, you tend not to get any judders and then lines and things in the surface. So although they're not the finest of cuts, the particular ones that I have. They do give a very even cut, so to speak, which subsequently is is easier to clean up with just a little bit of paper or, or just a, a little scrape. So I'm finding it very useful. And another little trick, which I've never heard anyone else doing. Um, so I don't know if this is... Uh, I don't know if this is widely done or not, but if it is, forgive me. It's just that I've come to it myself, and that is... When these clog up, which they do um, sometimes, if you have a cup of hot water and you just stick these in the hot water, because of the, the material these are made of, they won't rust or anything. Um, and the, the, the water just plims up the timber and then you can just literally, you know, the little dust and you can just go like that and they're clean again, swill them off dry them and of course they've been in hot water so they dry instantly anyway and uh it's a really it just means unclogging them is 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 a real piece of cake so to speak yeah um yeah that, right anyway whilst i carry on doing this so there were a couple of uh comments or questions um about the the video i did where i was um sort of having a go at well, just most of the way through shaping uh, the violin neck. Um, I'm seeking, yeah, Barry Mac 8061. I'm seeking the outcome of the violin you were creating with non-traditional natural holes within the back. Good health. Good health to you, sir. Well, yeah, I mean, the other one um, I've is, is all sanded and finished and is at the moment is, is undergoing its sort of finishing process. So that's had um, had its ground put on it. It's looking really good. It's hanging up in the conservatory because it's a sunny day today for the first time in ages. So it's catching a bit of sunlight whilst I get on with this one. I'm hoping to have this one um, prepared and the first coat of, you know, it's ground coat onto it by the close of play today because it's um, sort of just after midday on Friday. So it'd be nice then if I can do that, it means It'll have a couple of days sort of curing in the sun, if, if it's sunny, or curing in the UV chamber, if not. Um, and then next week, um, I will be hopefully starting on the violas um, that I've, or one of the violas that I've got ordered. And I will um, just, you know, on a, you need, you need about an hour a day when you're finishing violins and no more than that, really, uh, because the, a lot of finishing is sitting around waiting for things to happen. So. There we are. But yeah, that's where they are. They, um, the other one especially, being a little bit further on, I'm, I, I'm able to judge it better. It's, it's surprisingly resonant. I, I thought the, the little holes in the body might actually sort of kill the resonance a little bit. So I thought it, it would it'd be nice and loud, but I, I, I wasn't quite sure what the tone would be. But actually, with the other one and with this one you you can just tell it's 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 
it's going to be nice. So I've got very high hopes for both of these violins. So, yeah, Barry Mac, um, I will, um, you know, you will, I will be definitely doing a video about these two and the whole story of why I've chosen to use this crazy wood. Um, and that hopefully won't be much longer. Um, it needs, needs not to be too much longer because, uh, you know, I need to make about a violin a month uh, to keep my head above water. And um, it's, I've done one that's gone out already uh, this year. And so these two need to go out basically um, if I'm going to stay on target for one a month. I mean, I, ideally I'd like to do more than one a month, but I think one a month is a realistic kind of figure. And it's one that financially kind of works for me just about keeps the wolf in the door, keeps me happy. What more do you want? Um, anyway, yeah. Um, oh, Barry Mack goes on to say, uh, love anything non-conventional. Pushing boundaries creates excellence. When I start my first violin, I'll be using your plans as a spiritual guide. Well, I hope it, I hope they don't let you down, basically. And unconventional woods. Yeah, when you do that, like, like I always say, choose wood by, yeah, it's got to be attractive. It's got to be something that appeals to you. It's got to be structurally sound, ideally not too dense, but the absolute key thing is um, it needs to be resonant. It, you know, when you tap it, it, it's got to sound like it wants to be part of a xylophone, because if it goes thud, if it just absorbs energy and sound, it'll absorb all the energy when it's part of the violin as well. And that just doesn't lead to a good sound. On the subject of um, density, I mean, I'm kind of, you know, half wondering whether to revise my comments on that because um, I'm sure you you may or may not remember the video I did with um, Andy uh, Parrish's first violin when when he came to show me that, and that was that was made of oak, which I've always thought would probably be a little bit too dense. It's a little bit denser than ash, and um, certainly denser than maple. But you know what? That sounded that sounded great. So. I'm kind of, I'm part of me is thinking, hmm, I might try a nice oak violin. So uh, if I if I do find a really nice piece of oak, I don't think I would be averse to it anymore. So yeah, thank you, Andy, for that. Live and learn. Uh, right, MJFL uh, 036. This this again was about the neck shaping um, video. Thank you for the today's glimpse inside the shop, Graham. That's a pleasure, pleasure, mate. Your comment on how neck dimensions and shape will vary from one piece to piece reminds me of how guitar players test play dozens of Gibsons until finding one with a neck that feels just right in their hands. D shape, C shape, chunky, thin. I'm a guitar player and I'm to play, uh, I'm to maker, so this will be the foundation as I take on this first violin build. Yeah, do you know what? I mean, these things, you know, on the surface, they are all pretty pretty similar but actually I mean anyone who plays the violin will know they are so different they're completely different and it's not always the you know the same ones that are, appeal to different people it's um some people may think a particular violin is absolutely wonderful and then someone else may pick it up and think what on earth you know I can't play this and um I think unlike the guitar where I, well, no, with the guitar, even with just how you hold your hand and how you use a plectrum or your fingers, you still can create a sound, which means that you can identify a particular player instantly. Like Jimi Hendrix playing, you can hear anything by Jimi Hendrix and just know it's Jimi Hendrix. With the violin, you've got more parameters. You know, you don't have frets. So even how hard your fingertips are and how hard you press down on the string affects the tone uh, everything affects the tone how hard you press down on the bow how fast you move the bow the balance you know you can you can make the same volume by pressing down hard and moving slowly or pressing lightly and moving quickly um or anywhere in between so there are so many more parameters that affect the sound than do on the guitar there is a there is a logic to what i'm saying here believe me that um, I, I've always said this, violin makers 
all create, they all draw, they all draw the sound out of the violin by different means, you know? And so um, I think bearing that in mind, it is kind of logical that a, a violin that appeals to one person wouldn't appeal to another. So, you know, even within, you know, the same species of woods, you, you, you've got variation. You've certainly got variation in the arching and how thick the arching is. Everything, how tightly the sound post is in, the position of the sound post, every, all these things vary from one violin to the next. And so, I mean, one really sensible piece of advice I heard um, someone saying is, you know, when you pick up a violin, that sounds violin-y <laughs> then don't let it go you know it uh, and that might on the face of it that's a really strange thing to say it sounds violin-y what does that mean it, it means it produces the sound that you have in your head so if you can if you find a violin that actually makes the sound that you want then it, it's like finding your voice almost so it's very important. And as I say, we all all draw sound out of violins in slightly different ways. So they do respond, different violins respond to different people. We're back to, um, what's it? Back to the wand shop in Harry Potter, aren't we? Similar kind of thing again. Anyway. Yeah, so MJFL 036, totally agree with you. Uh, you just got to, they are all slightly different and those tiny, tiny, tiny little differences all add up and you just got to find the closest thing to uh, what it is you're after. And um, like I say, um, what I've always done, which seems to be working for me, is rather than um, slavery, slavishly following the exact standards as they are laid down um i just try and make the violins that i like th that work for me and i seem to find sufficient people who feel the same uh to make this business work so that's 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 my advice make the violins that you want you're going to be spending if you make a lot of violins you're going to be spending so much time making violins you might as well be making the ones that you like that's Kind of, God, I'm only halfway down the first page. I'm going to have to stop wittering and crack on a bit. Yankee Doodle. Ba, 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 ba. Those two good-looking violins on your bench in the background have gotten my attention. Looking great. There's a very good reason why Yankee Doodle says that. Yankee Doodle might well have something to do with this. We'll see. Let you know. Fireman 9143. I'm hoping you share your violin, your viola, pardon me, design process. I will. Um, I'm going to be over the weekend. I'm going to be back on my um, on AutoCAD again, sort of working on the plans again. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get those designs out and approved by the client, so that on Monday I can start actually sort of getting the wood out and starting work. Uh, that's that's the plan. That's the idea. Uh, but I will, uh, I'll be certainly be doing um, a video uh, about about all of that as we go. So, yeah, one, just explaining my intentions before I start probably be quite interesting, I think. it uh, Not just interesting for, you, you know, for anyone watching who's mildly interested in violas, but also interesting for me because there's nothing that makes you get your ideas straight in your head as much as explaining them to someone else. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I do these videos, it does kind of mean I have to get my ducks in a row, you know, which is, uh, sometimes in my life I've had a tendency just to sort of ignore the reasons for things and just meander on, on in my own little way, but having to, having to justify what I'm doing and explain it is, uh, is, is quite good in a way. WM Crash, just a word of encouragement on your viola efforts. A while back, I was reading some comment from a, vi a viola maker as he got started out. 
which apparently made a big improvement. The advice was, your problem is you're graduating it like a violin. I have no idea what it meant, if it helps, but there are some thoughts to linger. In this. But this is some thoughts to linger in your mind while you carve the viola plates. Hmm, am I graduating these like a violin? Yep, it, I mean, early days for me on the viola. Um, I think I'm quite lucky in that the first one I'm going to be doing is a quite a small one. It's only a 15, only a 15 inch viola. So it's kind of, it's going to feel like less of a jump from the violin than, uh, than the big one I've got to do after that, which is 16 and a half, which is going to, for me, it's going to feel like I'm working on a cello. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it though. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, Helen G 2274. Uh, instead of engraving designs, maybe pyrography might be a nice option for design on violins. Yeah, this uh, this relates to a conversation, um, a question from, I think it was DIY Dark Matter, who, who basically um, has obviously been thinking about using a, a, a laser engraver to, to sort of produce um, some detailed work for the ribs, which, should, you know, it's actually something I've already kind of been kicking around and possibly might well be something I do at some stage. I will keep you posted and you will see it here if I do. Um, but yeah, Helen is saying, you know, what about pyrography, which is, uh, I'm sure you, you know what it is, but basically if you imagine a sort of a, something very close to a soldering iron with a slightly finer tip um, and basically it's like you draw the designs onto the surface of the timber and it burns the surface of the timber as it goes, leaving a sort of dark line. And yeah, it was that actually was a technique that was used or is used extensively for decorating um, hard hanger fiddles. It's, um, I think it's be quite scary because um, it's obviously would be completely freehand. <laughs> so whether I, uh, whether I feel brave enough to do it or not, I don't know. It's yeah, but it's certainly one to consider. It might be might be quite interesting. I think you could you could probably do a lot of a lot of embellishment quite quickly doing that. Certainly more quickly than doing it the other way. Yeah, nice idea. Might be fun. Um, right, Matthew Grace, one oh five six. Nice to hear you're making a viola. What size did you choose? I decided to wade into the viola world recently. I can't, I keep saying violin. I'm so used to saying violin. Even as I read it, I keep trying to say violin. Nice to hear that you're making a viola. What size did you choose? I decided to wade into the viola world recently and it is a very different than the violin world for sure. There is essentially no standardization of sizes and stop lengths as neck lengths and such. As you know, I chose to make my new form 15 and 7 eighths as a good compromise. And then, he, ha, I see you answered later in the video. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're all over the place. And, and, and it's, you know, I was saying about violins all being very different within tight constraints. With violas, from what I can see, those constraints are blown open. So, gosh, there must be a huge amount of variation in violas. Um, so yeah, one one as I said, one is going to be fifteen inches, and the other one is going to be sixteen and a half. So two very different instruments. Um, yeah, on the I think on the fifteen one, what I'm actually going to be doing is um, almost stretching the neck a little bit and reducing, you know, moving the bridge and the f holes almost down a little bit, so that I get a really nice um string length which will give a better sound but keeping to a slightly smaller instrument and then on the um on the uh 16 and a half one um it's a slightly different case in that the the neck in proportion is all slightly smaller so the 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 sort of two to three proportion that you get on a normal, on a violin. Um, for example, on the 16 and a half one at the moment, it looks like it's gonna be sort of two, two, three point two, the, the sort of ratio. But yeah, I'll, I'll ex we'll see how it goes as we go. I'll, 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 I'll let you know as it goes. 
Uh, Sticky Larry, um, I thought bass bars were shorter on Baroque instruments as their structural aspect had less to withstand under a lower neck angle and gut strings. And I went on to reply, um, that's often said, but two things suggest otherwise. When most violins were converted to the newer style neck and beefier ba bass bars, everyone was still using gut strings. And that, I, I maintain that still is the case. I mean, most of the violins were converted from Baroque, uh, a sort of Baroque um, setup to a sort of classical setup, as we know it now, uh, in the 19th century, mid 19th century. And at that stage, you know, people were still all using gut strings, possibly with a steel E, I think, had perhaps started to come in. I'm not sure. But the it didn't that in itself doesn't explain why you would want a, a heavier bass bar. And the second part, the brake angle over the bridge and bridge height are pretty much the same in both setups. People always forget the massive wedged fingerboard on Baroque violins, which sets the fingerboard face angle and therefore also the strings at much the same angle. Yeah, let me just explain that. When you make a Baroque violin, you don't angle the neck back. Like, so you, on this, you see, for example, there's a, you know, the, 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 um, the neck is tilted back. Okay, so it's, I mean, it's not parallel. It does, you know, it does get thicker you know, from there to there, but it's close to parallel. And, you know, this height above here is given by the fact that this, that the whole neck is tilted back. Fine. On Baroque violins, this joint, you know, that that joint at the bottom of the neck was, was square. And incidentally, it wasn't cut into the body, it actually sat on the face of the ribs and it was nailed through from the inside. So that button was critical. I mean, it's so important, to, you know, for strength as it, as it still is really. Um, so at that point, you've got um, th this line from the underside of the front, if you like, that would be parallel with the line of the face of the neck, the actual neck. But what everyone forgets, is you didn't just have a fingerboard stuck on that. The fingerboard was put on after a sort of a wedge piece, which was quite long um, and quite thick. And um, so, so that the neck actually really changed in thickness dramatically from there to there. It was a, you know, real change. So you, which in many ways is really nice because you know exactly where you are. Such a, you know, very able to anchor your position on the neck, um, knowing that. But it does mean that in practice, the actual f face of the fingerboard, you know, the action bit, you know, the important bit where all it all happens, was pretty much in the same angle as the later ones. Um, and so the bridge height was about the same. So um, that doesn't explain why you would need a heavier bass bar. I think the main reason of, you know, for the change from um, the Baroque style neck to, the, to the, this classical one is because you, for various people, uh, various reasons, people, you know, preferred this one if you're going to be shifting up and down the neck all the time. So as the as the repertoire kind of um, generally kind of called for more and more sort of uh, position changes, then it just, it seemed to make sense. Um, so I think that's what that was about. However, a heavier bass bar basically gives a, a more robust bottom end to the sound. And I think it was simply that was introduced because people liked that sound. Um, so there we go. Yeah, that's, for me, that's the long and short of that one. Mr. Zombie, 170, what's your question? Okay. Oh, this was, uh, yeah. Um, I have an interesting idea for you. Would it be possible to make a violin or parts for a violin out of old wooden jack planes and, and triplanes? 
ones that are beyond repair and can't be used anymore. I'm a full-time wooden plane maker, so I know wooden planes are made out of good quality quarter sawn beech, particularly planes from the 1800s. I would be very interested to hear what you think. And as I said, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, why not? I mean, um, bear with me a second. I mean, these great big old planes are what we're talking about. And um, yeah, I mean, there's some beautiful wood in there. It would have to be a very big plane in order for you, for you to get a lot of useful stuff out of it. Um, and there's no way on earth that I'm going to be cutting up my plane. So... <laughs> um, but if anyone does have a couple of old planes that they want me to go at, send them along and I will have a go. I'd love to have a go, yeah. And I did actually answer him, do you have a donor plane or two? <laughs> um, Douglas Madlock. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I kind of suggested I probably wouldn't be doing so many Q&As and that probably is going to be the case. I might reduce it from weekly, uh, but it, I won't. There won't be a vacuum. I'll still be, I'll be doing other stuff, you know, I won't. You can't get rid of me that easily. Um, uh, Barry Mac 8061. Thank you, Graham, in regards to my veneer internal strength approach. The veneers are 0.2 mil thick. Um, yeah, I mean, this um, this this springs from... The, the, uh, Barry Mac was talking about repairing an old violin using sort of laminating, effectively, veneers on the inside. Um, it's interesting and um, look forward to seeing it. Send us some, send us some pictures, you know, do send us some pictures. Um, that's, I think, pretty much the sort of, um, pretty much it in terms of questions and so on that came in. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, other things, the other thing I've been thinking about uh, and uh, I'm going to do, um, I don't know how familiar with Baroque style bows you may or may not be. Um, this is a Baroque bow here. Um, I've slackened off the hair and you can see that the stick is effectively straight. Um, this does have a, a screw thread adjustment thing in here. Some of the earlier Baroque bows didn't even have that, they just had clip-in frogs. This is a frog. Um, but on this one, so when you tighten this up, then obviously because there's no reverse shape or camber, as it's called, put into the stick, it, it ends up doing this, okay? Uh, which is what it's supposed to do. Um, and the reason I mention that is I like using Baroque bows. They're pretty much what I use most of the time. Um, let's have a look at a classical bow, if you like. Um, this one's got a repair on the tip which is is not you know you don't see that on most of them but slack hair you can see that that's got a it's got a bend put into it a reverse camber as they call it or uh, which means when you tighten it it kind of it ends up straight or straighter um and that has some advantages uh, these tend to be longer if i put the two I'll put the, the actual length of the hair there. Yeah, which means because this adjustment knob is a bit longer. But uh, what you'll see is the Baroque bow is generally a lot shorter. It's normally got a completely different style of head. They're, they're a simpler bow, really. There's less going on with Baroque bows than there is with classical bows. And, um, I mean, this... The sort of Baroque bow, which a lot of people will have met, is not really a Baroque bow. This is this is a cheap Chinese bow, but it's got the, the camber. So it's, it's sort of a, it's a sort of a hybrid bow, if you like. They're shorter, um, but they've got that camber. So it's it's kind of halfway house. It, they're, they're, they can be very nice bows. Um, but why am I, why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you all of this because I have decided, um, because I play 
um, using a Baroque bow. And this was made for me by a bow maker called Glenn Titmus, and it's a lovely bow. But because of my natural curiosity, I can't help myself. I just think, I've started thinking I should be playing with a bow I've made myself. So I'm in the process of starting to make some bows. If it goes well, I'll inevitably start selling them. Um, if it doesn't go well, you'll probably never hear anything else about this ever again. <laughs> but um, I'll uh, I'll drag you all along on that process as, as we go, basically. But I just thought I'd mention it. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if there's any other subject I need or want to cover today. I'm going to... I've got my work cut out if I'm going to get the ground done on this. I should do. It's certainly possible, so that's what I'm aiming for this afternoon. Um, I don't know if that's focusing yet. Yeah, there we go. Very happy with this one. It's lovely. Anyway, that's it for now. Look after yourselves. Cheers, folks. Bye.